My dearly beloved in Christ, every year when we, on the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, read the wonderful story of the Good Samaritan in the Gospel, we should ask ourselves and make a little examination of conscience, which would I have been like? This poor man was beaten by the robbers and left half dead, and a priest passed by, and a Levite passed by. But then a Samaritan came and took pity on him and took care of him. So would we have been like the priest or the Levite, or rather like the Samaritan? So it's a good examination to ask ourselves, how much compassion and interest would we take in someone in, who is in need? Or would we just be selfish and not want to get involved and pretend that we hadn't seen the poor injured man? So a, a good topic to examine ourselves on. But this morning I would like rather to concentrate on the first words of today's gospel in which our Lord is speaking to his disciples and he says to them, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, and they have not seen it, and to hear what you hear, and they have not heard it. Imagine going back for hundreds and hundreds of years in the Old Testament, all those great prophets who predicted the Messiah, who told what he would be like, and how much they must have desired to be able to be present when he made his appearance on the earth, to hear him speak and to witness the miracles. Isaiah, in particular, talked about the miracles that the Messiah would work, of healing the blind and the lame and the sick and paralyzed and so forth. And the disciples of our Lord witnessed these every day. And not only they, but so many others witnessed them or were recipients of these wonderful miracles. So many thousands, literally thousands, that our Lord cured. Only a small fraction of the miracles worked by our Lord are recorded by the evangelists in the four Gospels. In fact, St. John says at the conclusion of his Gospels, many other things did Jesus do and say which are not written down in this book. And if they were to be written down, the whole world could not contain the books that would have to be written. So again, the Gospels contain just a small fraction of all of the miracles our Lord worked. In fact, there are occasions when the evangelists say that many sick were brought to our Lord and as many as were brought to him, he cured. And sometimes our Lord was in this, engaged in this labor of love for hours, wearing himself out, curing the sick, and again, teaching the good news of the gospel. So blessed indeed were the eyes that witnessed this and the ears that heard his words. And yet, what is so amazing to us is that despite these miracles, so many were unfaithful to our Lord. So many eventually called out for his crucifixion and death. And even if they, those who were in Jerusalem on Good Friday and called out crucify him, even if they had not personally witnessed miracles, they no doubt knew that our Lord was this great benefactor who worked so many miracles. And it is indeed what some have referred to as the mystery of iniquity. How could someone who had witnessed these things turn against our Lord? And it reminds us of the martyrs down through the centuries who were put to death, who were persecuted, as our Lord said his followers would be for him. There were indeed martyrs who were put to death by tyrants who themselves had witnessed miracles that the saints had worked. And it reminds us of the words of our Lord to his disciples, if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. That someone could witness so many wonderful things and still 
turn against our Lord. But we must remember that if they did that to him, they may well do it to us, as they did to the martyrs down through the centuries. And this morning, I would like to speak about one martyr in particular, St. Philomena, because yesterday was her feast day, and she is indeed a saint for our times. And so we should know some of the circumstances of her life. We've all heard of St. Philomena. She's a wonderful virgin and martyr who was put to death when she was only 13 years old, probably around the year 300. Now, what we do know for certain of St. Philomena was that on May 24th in 1802, I believe was the year, there were some workers who were excavating in the catacombs. Now, the catacombs, of course, are these tunnels outside of Rome, under the ground, that go for miles. In fact, it has been said if all the catacombs were to be stretched out end to end, they would go many, many miles. I don't remember the number, an incredible distance, because there are different levels of the catacombs. So you go down to one level and then another level and another level, and the soil is such that it could be excavated with these tunnels. Now, the early Christians used them to bury their dead and also to hide from persecution. But later, once the catacombs were, were inspected or were excavated, because maybe some places they had fallen in and so forth, there's only something like 10% of the catacombs that have been explored. And so... In the early 1800s, there were some workers who were down there in the catacombs of St. Priscilla. And they came upon a tomb that had never been noticed before. And there were three slabs over the tomb. And they said the words, Pax Tecum Philomena, which means peace to you, Philomena. So they knew they had come upon the um, tomb of an early Christian martyr, because there were symbols on the slabs, I believe uh, a lily and a palm, and the palm was always a symbol of martyrdom and the lily of purity. And so they reported this to the authorities, and the next day the slabs were removed, and they found inside the remains of this young virgin martyr and also a, um, a vase that had dried blood in it. Now, the early Christians had the custom when someone was martyred, they would try to gather up the blood. They would soak it up in linen and keep it as precious relics. So they understood that this was the um, blood that she had shed. And also there were symbols inside of arrows and an anchor. So these relics were taken then, and they were placed in a large warehouse with all these relics of the saints and martyrs. And there was a priest from a small town in Italy close to Naples. And this priest had a great desire to have the relic of a saint for his own church in Mugnano, Italy. So he went to Rome and just being a parish priest, he would not have been able to obtain um, the relics of a saint. But he had a bishop who was his friend and who presented his case and interceded for him and ended up obtaining permission for him to obtain the relics of a saint. So he was led into this large storehouse. And as he went by where the relics of St. Philomena were contained, he felt a sudden desire to have this particular martyr, the relics of this particular saint. He was just overwhelmed with, with joy and, a, and a, again, an intense desire to have those relics. And eventually he was able to obtain them. They were taken back to Mugnano in the carriage and interesting thing happened. He had the relics in a box on the floor and this box kept knocking up against his legs. And even though the cart had not been jolting at that particular moment. So he realized she wanted to be on the seat. So he picked up the box and placed them on the seat opposite him. Then when, the, when he arrived in Naples before arriving at his church, they had an artist 
make a statue of the saint and put the relics inside the statue, a wax image of a woman and the relics inside. But it wasn't very beautiful. In fact, it was done by an, a mediocre artist and wasn't very attractive. And one of the many, many miracles uh, regarding St. Philomena was that after the image was put in the church, in the place prepared, and the church was locked up at night, next morning they went in and the image had changed. It became a little longer, a little more beautiful. And this happened several times. The hair grew on the uh, statue that was made of the, of the Virgin Martyr. At any rate, the blood, the dried blood that was in this broken vessel was carefully scraped off and put inside a crystal vase, a crystal urn. And the blood sparkled like precious uh, jewels and diamonds, but it would turn black if someone unworthy came into the church. And, and this, again, happened numerous times, many miracles. Well, there are very many miracles. Almost right away, miracles began to be granted at this little village of Mugnano that had the relics of St. Philomena. And uh, this, you know, spread, this information spread. And finally, and again, it was 1805 that the relics were taken to Mugnano. They arrived on August the 10th, and that would have been the Feast of St. Philomena, the day they arrived in the town, except it was already the Feast of St. Lawrence. So the Feast of St. Philomena was fixed to the 11th of August. And there began to be many miracles. Well, this information spread far and wide, and eventually, in 1835, there was a young woman who was extremely ill who lived in southern France, I think in the area of Lyon. Her name was Pauline Marie Jericho. And Pauline Jericho was very instrumental. She founded three organizations. One was the Society for the Propagation of the Faith to raise funds for missions, missionaries in mission countries. Also the Society of the Holy Childhood. And uh, let's see, there was a third, the Living Rosary. She, she was a very prominent lay person from a wealthy family, used her wealth for these works and did a great deal of good. Well, she was gravely ill and she went to visit the shrine of St. Philomena. Her doctors thought she would not survive the journey and she was completely cured at the shrine. And this is often referred to as the great miracle of Mugnano, the cure of her. And that was the reason why Pope Gregory XVI canonized St. Philomena. He saw her on her way to Mugnano, she passed through Rome, and he thought she wouldn't even finish the journey, or if she did, he even told those around him, we will never see our daughter again, referring to her. We will never see her again. And he was so thrilled when she came back to Rome, completely cured. He had her remain in Rome for a year, and the uh, Roman congregations went through the normal process documenting all the miracles, etc., and eventually the canonization of St. Philomena. And then the next pope, Pope Pius IX, wrote a, a mass and office for her feast, etc. The popes since that time have said wonderful things about St. Philomena. St. Pius X contributed a, um, a precious ring to put on the finger of the statue. Pope Pius IX offered mass at her shrine. And again, the popes have said wonderful things. But what is interesting about St. Philomena is that she was unknown for 1,500 years. From the time of her martyrdom, around the year 300, up until her, her relics were discovered in 1802. Utterly unknown. And that would seem to be one of the reasons why God has favored her with so many miracles. You might say to make up for her, make up to her for that being unknown for those many centuries. Now, there were several uh, devotees of St. Philomena who wanted to know about her, and they prayed to know what were the circumstances of her life. And she appeared simultaneously to three different persons who knew, did not know one another, lived in different countries, 
One was a nun in Naples, another was a priest, another was an artist. And she revealed to them the details of her life, that her parents, her father was a king of a small Grecian uh, city, state in Greece, and he fell into disfavor with Diocletian, the Roman emperor. So he went to Rome to plead his case because he was either going to be removed for, from office or maybe there was going to be a battle or something. So he went to, to plead his case before the emperor. And the emperor saw there he came with his wife and daughter, his daughter Philomena. And the emperor saw his daughter and he said, well, I want to marry your daughter. And the king and his wife were both fine. That'd be wonderful because that would bring peace to their little kingdom. And St. Philomena, being a Christian, refused. And she had consecrated her virginity to Christ. And she was tortured in different ways. Attempts were made to, martyr, to kill her, to martyr her. Uh, an, uh, an anchor was tied about her. She was thrown into the Tiber River. And then there she was standing on the shore. Air, she was shot with arrows and then the next day was completely cured. Second time, an attempt was made to pierce her with arrows, and they turned around and went back and pierced the archers who shot them. So there were these different attempts to martyr her, and finally, she was beheaded. So these were the details that she revealed. But an interesting thing, the nun, I think her name was Sister Louisa, who had this revelation, one of the three that had the revelation of the circumstances of St. Philomena's life. She had a vision of St. Philomena going before the throne of our Blessed Mother in Heaven with all these petitions of people who had asked St. Philomena for this or that, etc. So she had all these petitions, and she went before the throne of our Blessed Mother and asked for the granting of these petitions. And Our Lady said the words, to Philomena, nothing is refused. And that has been often quoted, uh, books, pamphlets written about St. Philomena, to Philomena, nothing is refused. And those who have been devoted to St. Philomena have experienced the power of her intercession. And again, it seems that she is one of the greater saints for uh, intercession because of the fact that she was unknown for so many centuries, and also because of her bravery, her virginity, her martyrdom, the circumstances of her martyrdom, her complete devotion to Christ, that she would give up the opportunity to become, to be married to the emperor, to become the queen, give up that for her love of our Lord and be willing to lay down her life at such a tender age. So she's a powerful saint and we should all invoke her and reflect upon all of the martyrs, how they loved our Lord so much that they were willing to even sacrifice their lives. And as our Lord said to those who were alive at that time that many have desired to see what you see and have not seen it and to hear what you hear, etc. How blessed we are we have not only the Gospels, we have not only the teachings of our Lord, the Mass, the sacraments, but we have the heritage, the history of all these wonderful saints that we can read, we can invoke them. They are our friends who will intercede for us, and we can look to them and strive to imitate their virtues and pray that we might one day share their crowns in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.